If you're just joining us, we're doing um, five different Harvard courses um, this morning. And we have a very uh, loud guest lecturer who wants to be heard every moment. I'm sorry about that. A big part of my live streams before I took a four or five year vacation was uh, education. Five Harvard textbooks that your average Harvard student would be studying and read those textbooks. And some people may want to listen in along. Some people may have learned this a long time ago, but regardless, that's the program for today. All right, it's, uh, this is the preface. Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman once noted that nature has a far, far better imagination than our own. A few things in the universe illustrate this observation better than the cell. A tiny sack of molecules capable of self-replication, this marvelous structure constitutes the fundamental building block of life. We are made of cells. Cells provide all the nutrients we consume, and the continuous activity of cells makes our planet habitable. To understand ourselves and the world uh, of which we are a part, we need to know something uh, of the life of cells. Armed with such knowledge, we as citizens and stewards of the global community will be better equipped to make well-informed decisions about increasingly sophisticated issues from climate change and food security to biomedical technologies and emerging epidemics. In Essential Cell Biology, we introduce readers to the fundamentals of cell biology. The fifth edition introduces powerful new techniques that allow us to examine cells and their components with unprecedented precision, such as super-resolution fluorescence microscopy and cryo-electron microscopy, as well as the latest methods for DNA sequencing and gene editing. We discuss new thinking about how cells organize and encourage the chemical reactions that make life possible, and we review recent insights into human origin, or human origins and genetics. With each edition of ECB, Essential Cell Biology, its authors re-experience the joy of learning something new and surprising about cells. We are also reminded of how much we still don't know. Many of the fascinating questions, uh, the most fascinating questions in cell biology remain unanswered. How did cells arise on the early earth, multiplying and diversifying through billions of years of evolution to fill every possible niche, from steaming vents in the ocean floor to frozen mountaintops, and in doing so, transform our plan planet's entire environment? How is it possible for billions of cells to seamlessly cooperate and form large multicellular organisms like ourselves? These are among the many challenges that remain for the next generation of cell biologists, some of whom will begin a wonderful lifelong journey with this textbook. Readers interested in learning how scientific inquisitiveness can fuel breakthroughs in our understanding of cell biology will enjoy the stories of discovery presented in each chapter's How We Know feature. Packed with experimental data and design, these narratives illustrate how biologists tackle important questions and how experimental results shape future ideas. In this edition, a new How We Know recounts the discoveries that first reveal how cells transformed, transformed the energy locked in food molecules into the forms used to power the metabolic reactions on which life depends. As in previous editions, the questions in the margins at the end of the chapter not only test comprehension, but also encourage careful thought and the application of newly acquired information to a broader biological context. Some of these questions have more than one valid answer and others invite speculation. Answers to all the questions are included in the back of the book and many provide additional information or alternative perspective on material presented in the main text. More than 160 video clips, animations, atomic structures, and high resolution micrographs complement the book and are available online. The movies are correlated with each chapter and call outs are highlighted in color. <laughs> this is supplemental material, let's get my teaching assistant here. This supplemental material created to clarify complex and critical concepts highlights the intrinsic beauty of living cells. For those who wish to probe even more deeply, molecular biology of the cell, now in its sixth edition, offers a detailed account of the life of the cell. In addition, Molecular Biology of the Cell, 6th edition of Problems Approach by Wilson and Hunt, provides a goldmine of thought-provoking questions at all levels of difficulty. We have drawn upon this tour de force of experimental reasoning for some of the questions in essential cell biology, and we are very grateful to its authors. Every chapter of ECB is the product of a communal effort. Both text and figures are revised and refined as drafts circulated from one author to another, many times over and back again. The numerous other individuals who have helped bring this product to fruition are credited in the acknowledgments that follow. Despite our best efforts, it is inevitable that errors have crept into the book and we encourage eagle eye readers who find mistakes to let us know so that we can correct them in the next printing. Here are all the acknowledgments and we will move on to chapter one. Let's look at the authors very briefly. Bruce Alberts received his PhD from Harvard and is professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics at UCSF, editor-in-chief of science, wow. From 2008 to 2013, that's one of my favorite journals, and served as the president of the US NAS from 1993 to 2005. Wow, very cool. Chapter one, cells, the fundamental units of life. What does it mean to be living? 
Petunias, people, and pond scum are all alive. Stones, sand, and summer breezes are not. But what are the fundamental properties that characterize living things and distinguish them from non-living matter? The answer hinges on a basic fact that is taken for granted now, but marked a revolution in thinking when first established more than 175 years ago. All living things or organisms are built from cells, small, membrane-enclosed units filled with a concentrated aqueous solution of chemicals and endowed with the extraordinary ability to create copies of themselves by growing and then dividing in two. The simplest forms of life are solitary cells. Higher organisms, including ourselves, are communities of cells derived by growth and division from a single founder cell. Every animal or plant is a vast colony of individual cells, each of which performs a specialized function that is integrated by intricate systems of cell-to-cell -cell communication. Just so you know, we're going to talk about unity and diversity of cells, cells under the microscope, the prokaryotic cell, the eukaryotic cell, and model organisms. Cells, therefore, are the fundamental units of life. Thus, it is to cell biology, the study of cells and their structure, function, and behavior, that we look for an answer to the question of what life is and how it works. With a deeper understanding of cells, we can begin to tackle the grand historical problems of life on Earth, its mysterious origins, its stunning diversity produced by billions of years of evolution, and its invasion of every conceivable habitat on the planet. At the same time, cell biology can provide us with answers to the questions we have about ourselves. Where did we come from? How do we develop from a single fertilized egg cell? How is each of us similar to, yet different from, everyone else on Earth? Why do we get sick, grow old, and die? In this chapter, we introduce the concept of cells, what they are, where they come from, and how we have learned so much about them. We begin by looking at the great variety of forms that cells can adopt, and we take a preliminary glimpse at the cellular machinery or chemical machinery that all cells have in common. We then consider how cells are made visible under the microscope and what we, can, what we see when we peer inside them. Finally, we discuss how we can exploit the similarities of living things to achieve a coherent understanding of all forms of life on Earth, from the tiniest bacterium to the mightiest oak and the mightiest cat, right? Biologists, uh, so let's talk about the unity and diversity of cells. Biologists estimate that there may be up to 100 million distinct species of living things on our planet. Organisms as different as a dolphin and a rose or a bacterium and a butterfly. Cells, too, differ vastly in form and function. Animal cells differ from those in a plant, and even cells within a single multicellular organism can differ wildly in appearance and activity. Yet despite these differences, all cells share a fundamental chemistry and other common features. In this section, we take stock of some of the similarities and differences among cells, and we discuss how all present-day cells appear to have evolved from a common ancestor. Cells vary enormously in appearance and function. When comparing one cell to another, one of the most obvious places to start with is size. A bacterial cell, say a lactobacillus in a piece of cheese, is a few micrometers, or micro m. This is the Greek letter mu. If you haven't seen it before. I have my Wacom tablet. Maybe I should plug it in. I was going to just sort of point out, uh, we all know what one meter is, right? How long is a meter? It's around three feet. Three feet, right? It's like 3.2 feet exactly, I think. It's almost like a yard. Let's yeah. see. One meter, two feet. 3.28, actually. So it's more like 3.3. 3.28084. All right, so one millimeter is a thousandth of that. So we all know, we know how big a millimeter is, right? It's very, very thin. Extremely small distance. Centimeter is about you know, the length of a finger knuckle. So um, a millimeter is, is one tenth of a centimeter. So a micrometer is one one thousandth of a millimeter and one one millionth of a meter. Is a micrometer visible? This is supposed to be micrometer. No, it's not visible. Just below the threshold of probably we lose the ability to discern maybe around like 100 micrometers. So one micrometer is too small. So that's about 25 times smaller than the width of a human hair. 
So that's the that's the diameter, maybe length of the bacterial cell. So not quite so microscopic. It's microscopic, but it's not like it's so so small. It's almost you know um, impossible to uh, see. It's it's definitely not within the ability for us to discern. But it's not like it's that far away. It's not like it's an atom or something. At the other extreme, a frog egg, which is also a single cell, has a diameter about, of about one millimeter, which is technically uh, visible. If we scale them up to make the lactobacillus the size of a person, the frog egg would be half a mile high. Cells vary just as widely in their shape. A typical nerve cell in your brain, for example, is enormously extended. It sends out its electrical signals along a single fine protrusion called an axon that is 10,000 times longer than, it's th than, it, than it is thick. So it's very long, like a piece of string almost. And the cell receives signals from other nerve cells through a collection of shorter extensions that sprout from its body like the branches of a tree. A pond-dwelling paramecium, on the other hand, is shaped like a submarine and is covered with thousands of cilia, hair-like projections whose sinuous coordinated beating sweeps the cell forward, rotating as it goes. A cell in the surface layer of a plant is squat and immobile, surrounded by a rigid box of cellulose with an outer waterproof covering of wax. A macrophage in the body of an animal, by contrast, crawls through tissues, constantly pouring itself into new shapes as it searches for and engulfs debris, foreign microorganisms, and dead or dying cells. A fission yeast is shaped like a rod, whereas a budding yeast is delightfully spherical, and so on. Cells are enormously diverse in their chemical requirements. Some require oxygen to live. For others, the gas is deadly. Some cells consume little more than carbon dioxide, sunlight, and water as their raw materials. Others need a complex mixture of molecules produced by other cells. These differences in size, shape, and chemical requirements often reflect differences in cell function. Some cells are specialized factories for the production of particular substances, such as hormones, starch, fat, latex, or pigments. Others, like muscle cells, are engines that burn fuel to do mechanical work. Still others are electricity generators, like the modified muscle cells in the electric eel, or electric eel. I don't know if I could go to Harvard to do a postgrad, but... Some modifications specialize a cell so much that the cell ceases to proliferate, thus producing no descendants. Such specialization would be senseless for a cell that lived a solitary life. In a multicellular organism, however, there is a division of labor among cells, allowing some cells to become specialized to an extreme degree for particular tasks and leaving them dependent on their fellow cells for many basic requirements. Even the most basic need of all, that of passing on the genetic instructions of the organism to the next generation, is delegated to specialists, the egg and the sperm. Living cells have a similar basic chemistry. Despite the extraordinary diversity of plants and animals, people have recognized from time immemorial that these organisms have something in common, something that entitles them all to be called living things. But while it seemed easy enough to recognize life, it was remarkably difficult to say in what sense all living things were alike. Textbooks had to, had to settle for defining life in abstract general terms related to growth, reproduction, and an ability to actively alter their behavior in response to the environment. Let's actually look here at question 1-1. One, one. Life is easy to recognize, but difficult to define. According to one popular biology text, living things are one, highly organized compared to natural inanimate objects. Two, they display homeostasis, maintaining a relative, relatively constant internal environment. Three, they reproduce themselves. Four, they grow and develop from simple beginnings. Um, five, they take energy and matter from the environment and transform it. Six, they respond to stimuli. Seven, they show adaptation to their environment. Score of person, vacuum cleaner, and a potato with respect to these characteristics. Um, the discoveries of biochemists and molecular biologists have provided an elegant solution to this awkward situation. Although the cells of all living things are enormously varied when viewed from the outside, they are fundamentally similar inside. We now know that cells resemble one another to an astonishing degree in the details of their chemistry. They are composed of the same sorts of molecules, which participate in the same types of chemical reactions, discussed in chapter 2. In all organisms, genetic information in the form of genes is carried in DNA molecules. This information is written in the same chemical code constructed out of the same chemical building blocks, interpreted by essentially the same chemical machinery, and replicated in the same way when a cell or organism reproduces. Let's take a break to look at uh, figure 1-1. So we're looking at a 100 micrometer 
resolution here. Uh, figure 1-1 one, one cells come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Note the very different scales in these micrographs. This one's 25, 25, 5, and 3. Drawing of a single nerve cell from a mammalian brain. This is here. A. This cell has a single unbranched extension, the axon. You can see it there. Projecting towards the top of the image, though through which it sends electrical signals to other nerve cells and possesses a huge branching tree of projections, these are called dendrites, through which it receives signals from as many as 100,000 other nerve cells. And again, notice the scale here. This is 100 micrometers, almost visible, almost visible uh, amount uh, or length, I should say. This is a paramecium, a commonly studied uh, uh, protozoan. A single giant cell swims by means of the beating cilia that covers its surface. The surface of a snapdragon flower petal displays an orderly arrangement of packed cells. D is a macrophage spreading itself out as it patrols animal tissues in search of invading organisms. And A, a fission yeast, is also caught in the act of dividing into two. The medial septum, stained red, is forming a wall between the two nuclei, also stained red, that have separated into two daughter cells. Uh, the cell membranes are stained green. All right. In every cell, long polymer chains of DNA are made from the same set of four monomers called nucleotides. Very important, nucleotides. This is where, where we get uh, mRNA, which we'll talk about in a second. Strung together in different sequences, like the letters of an alphabet. The information encoded in these DNA molecules is read out or transcribed, very important, transcribed into a related set of polynucleotides called RNA. Although some of these RNA molecules have their own regulatory, structural, or chemical activities, most are translated. So we have transcribed and translated. The DNA gets transcribed into RNA, and the RNA gets translated into a different type of polymer called a protein. So a polymer is just any molecule with repeating units any molecule with repeating units. That includes plastics or polymers, but also biomolecular molecules too. This flow of information from RNA to DNA, or sorry, from DNA to RNA to protein is so fundamental to life that it is referred to as the central dogma, the central dogma of biology. And here's a look at it from the, this side. DNA, RNA, protein, DNA synthesis, replicates, that's not too important right now. That's when cells divide and things like that. But RNA synthesis is when we go from DNA to RNA. These are both nucleotides. There's some subtle differences that make RNA, RNA, and DNA, DNA. But either way, from the, this RNA template, we can translate this into proteins. And these proteins are made of amino acids. So that's the central dogma. The appearance and behavior of a cell are dictated largely by its protein molecules, which serve as structural supports, chemical catalysts, molecular motors, and much more. Proteins are built from amino acids. There's one thing you need to know in biology, this is it. And all organisms use the same set of 20 amino acids. We have 26 letters in English, but God has 20 amino acids to make their proteins. But the amino acids are linked in different sequences. Just the same way we can make a lot of different words with 20 amino acids, we can make a lot of different proteins with, uh, we can make a lot of words with 26 alphabet letters, excuse me. We can make a lot of different proteins with 20 amino acids. But the amino acids are linked in different sequences, giving each type of protein molecule a different three-dimensional shape or conformation. So even the change of one amino acid in the wrong place can create a uh, disastrous uh, situation. Let me show you. 